Uh, Dr. Ryan Cox is the Extension Meat Specialist for the University of Minnesota. He has a primary appointment in the Department of Animal Science and a secondary appointment in the Department of Food Science and Nutrition. Uh, what I'm going to talk about very briefly this evening is sort of the nuts and bolts, sort of the fundamentals of getting the hide off and understanding those acronyms, things like REA and PYG and KDH. Um, so really getting back to the basics of what the carcass and how it's evaluated. With my title, including the phrases pre-harvest quality, I be remiss without mentioning the quality assurance. Uh, I think this is a major portion of quality in our, in our beef supply uh, and, and recommend that if you've not gotten those resources in the past, I de definitely recommend you go and definitely go to bqa.org and, and find them. But, but the question I ask is why do I mention beef quality assurance and, and when we're talking about getting the hide off and talking about quality, um, this is the reason why. Uh, things like dark cutters, when I'm comparing uh, regular beef to something that I can affect on the farm. Uh, this is going to get back to animal management, transport quality, uh, things like that. So this is very important. Uh, things like bruises, this definitely affects bottom line. Uh, when we're talking about bruises on cattle, uh, this is uh, very important. This massively decreases the value of that carcass. And it's something we can affect pre-mortem um, before slaughter. It's something that we can do very easily. Uh, and it's probably one of the easiest ways that we can affect the, the, the price of the carcass. In addition to that, in addition to these bruises that again take away value from this carcass, and these lean cuts, uh, also injection sites, and there's certainly a lot of information about injection site lesions and, and scarring. Uh, I always tell people this is not something I want to feed my family, and I would hope it's not something you want to feed your family. Um, and so the knowing the proper way uh, to administer injections and things like that really just gets back to some, some fundamentals um, and, and standard operating procedures for us out in the operation. So again, I would be a little remiss, but Talking about marketing beef and, and where we're going and when we're getting to the packing plan, I'll just talk very briefly about a couple of options we have. But basically this is going to dictate the type of animal that you're producing. Obviously we do a number of different options, custom exempt being one. Uh, direct marketing, you may have a direct marketing agreement with, with a processor. Um, a cold cattle processor and then finally fed cattle processing. That's what I'm going to concentrate my, my, my discussion on is, is fed cattle processing. However, I, I do feel it's important to mention this only because I get this call probably once a week, if not more often, uh, with custom processors. Please understand that when you're, when you're going custom exempt with a custom processor, a product's not for sale. Uh, that, that, that individual is performing a service for you. Uh, you maintain ownership of that animal and they're performing the service of, of slaughtering the animal and cutting it up and packaging it for you. Uh, so please keep that in mind. With direct marketing, this is very typically done uh, with, with smaller to medium sized meat processors uh, with some sorts of agreement. Uh, but again, that largely, it, you may or may not maintain ownership of certain parts or whole portions of that carcass as well. Uh, and then finally, selling the, the, your cattle to the processor. And this is really what you're doing, is you're, you're, you're releasing ownership of the product, um, you're selling the animal to the processor. There may be some sort of marketing agreement uh, afterwards, but very commonly, uh, this is what we talk about with fed cattle marketing, and this is what I'm going to basically emphasize uh, this evening. You've basically got two choices when you leave the feedlot. Um, you're either going to be doing a, uh, you're going to market live cattle, and I'll touch on both of these a little bit, but you're also perhaps going to be marketing what we call the grid, or, or, or marketing based on the, the dress carcass. And I'm going to talk a little bit about both of those. Uh, when I talk about live marketing, I get my commodity report very much every day, just like many of you probably do, checking prices. I'm talking about basically treating uh, cattle very much like a commodity uh, based on its weight. It has a value by weight. And it's a very common uh, method of marketing cattle to the producer, and I'll go to the processor, and I'll get down here in a second. Um, it does represent the majority of trade for beef uh, here in the United States. Um, it's basically a bulk pricing system. There's very little wiggle room. Um, it's priced basically at the feedlot, most commonly, and there's very little price variation in this type of marketing. Um, it's simple, it's to the point, it's considered in some ways less risk, and in some ways uh, we can't actually run some risk, and we've actually given talks that would show both ways, actually. Grid marketing is the other way that I mentioned. This actually does uh, sort of account for about 40% of trade uh, of beef carcasses here in the United States. It's value-based, which means, okay, fine, we're going to basically pay you on the actual value as it hangs in the cooler. Uh, once, we, once we get the hide off and understand what we have as far as quantity and quality, then we're going to give you a value for your carcass. Um, so that it gets priced at the plant. Um, tr trucking is commonly done by the seller. And there is a, a much higher price variation sort of initially considered a little bit more risky, but in, in reality, you can get a premium for a higher quality carcass. If you feel as though your, your product is going to be higher quality or is going to meet certain 
standards for yield or quality, uh, then you may benefit from this type of pricing. And so that would be here. And so if, uh, very commonly, if you see uh, the commodity market uh, reports come out, you'll see live cattle information, but you'll also see the USDA beef complex. And that's really what it's referring to is grid pricing. Uh, what, what choice and select beef are trading for? It's sort of interesting. I took yesterday's uh, report, and we're certain we're, we were currently on an inversion right now, select and choice. Um, so right now, select is demanding a slightly higher price than choice um, by, by the market, by, by the complex. So it's sort of an interesting uh, note. If you've seen that report, I would, I would imagine many of you have. How many have actually seen this report before? Uh, very few when I go to give these talks have actually seen this report. Uh, this is the daily Carlot meat report. This is basically a summary of how meat has traded either for the week or for the day. And so it's getting down to the nuts and bolts, the portions, what they're worth, uh, the value of the different qualities and the yield grades, the outliers, the discounts that you may receive for grid pricing. Um, probably one of the most valuable tables among a number of tables in this report. I very commonly go to the outlier table because it summarizes a lot of information. Uh, if you're looking at underweight prices uh, for cattle, if you can see here, you've got quality grades as well as yield grades and their corresponding carcass weights. And so this tells you a lot of information about how those carcasses are trading. And I'll touch on this a little bit more when we talk about carcass size. But you'll see you've got both discounts and premiums uh, based on the size of these carcasses going through the plants as well. So uh, if you've not done that, I would encourage you to go and look for the Carlot Report just to understand if you've not uh, gotten exposed to grid pricing in the past, uh, to, like, to take a look at that report. Uh, moving forward, uh, understanding a little bit about the process, I do need to mention uh, hot carcass weight or the concept of dressing percentage. Please understand that if you're going to the rail, there is going to be a disparity uh, in the price that are in the live weight and the, in the hot carcass weight. Um, dressing percentages, there's a calculation, basically it's the, the, the weight of the hot carcass rolling into the cooler divided by the weight of the live animals. What we've got left after we go through the harvest process or the slaughter process. Um, in beef, we're talking about 60 to 65 percent of the products going to go into the cooler. On average, 62 to 63 percent. Some dress, higher yielding animals are going to dress more, lower yielding less. Um, but you're talking somewhere between 60 and 65 for fed cattle. Push that down about 10 percent when you go into a grass fed system. You can actually push that up in some very high yielding cattle as well. But for the most part, this is what we're talking about. And this is a call I also get very commonly. When people are direct marketing or using small processors, they tell me that they, they send a 1,400 pound steer to their processor and they only got back about 415 pounds of beef. They're trying to figure out where all of it goes. I commonly have to remind people to try as we might. We have a hard time eating bone, we have a hard time eating fat, and we really don't want to eat any of the internal organs of those animals. And so that has to go somewhere. And that does have a value in drop credit, however, does not play into that grid pricing. And so carcass grading a little bit on, on where we're going to go with the actual value, basically how good and how much, and that's where we get quality and yield grade. And so I always say, how good is the eating experience going to be with the product, and then how much beef am I actually going to get from the carcass itself? That's really what uh, quality and yield grade tell us. Starting with quality grade, uh, the quality grades for fed cattle, basically fed cattle in the feedlot, are going to be largely prime choice, select, and standard. Um, the, other, the other grades for non-fed cattle are going to be your no-roll. If you've ever heard the phrase no-roll or non-graded cattle, these are, these are very largely slumped together. Uh, we're, not, we're not stamping for any of these individual different no-roll grades. They're, they're largely just not graded. Uh, but again, it's, you're trying to measure the expected palatability of the product, the expected quality, and this is the one way that we do that. Quality grade has basically got two factors that dictate what quality grade is. The first is maturity. Uh, we have to understand that a younger carcass, a younger animal is going to be more tender. It's going to be a better eating experience. As well as marbling. Um, like it or not, fat is flavor. Um, fat is good for flavor. And the more fat that's within the muscle, within that, within that muscle, uh, that's going to be a better eating experience. So those two together dictate quality grade. Other, other factors or secondary factors we might consider are lean texture, lean color, and lean firmness. But I can tell you in, in a packing plant where this evaluation is done in five to seven seconds, uh, these secondary factors are very largely um, negated most of the time. That interrelationship where we talk about maturity and marbling will give us basically this grid. And so you can see across the top, uh, these are maturities. We give them A, B, C, D, and E maturity. And these are just categories of, of animal maturity. And then along the left side, these are, these are amounts of marbling within that ribeye. Okay, and that relationship between the two, meaning a very young carcass with lots of marbling, is going to go prime choice, select, or standard. You'll notice here that this B column is where we cut off all of these, these uh, ideal grades. 
you go into C maturity and beyond, and those basically are no roll cattle. Okay, so these are the ones that are not going to get any premium for their grain. Typically older carcasses. Um, just to let you know what those maturities really equate to, we call them chemical maturity because they're approximate chronological maturities, but they more have to do with the body composition of the animal. Uh, a maturity, you're talking about 9 to 30 months of age. Uh, B maturity is 30 to 42 months of age. And that 42 months of age is certainly significant from uh, certain regulatory perspectives. Beyond that, when you're talking about older animals, they simply will not grade, and they, they won't be able to do that. How do we determine that? Well, um, I can show you a number of locations within the carcass where they evaluate maturity. If I've got the time in my knee lab, hang a carcass and walk through it for 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and, and we certainly do that. However, on, on the rail in the packing plant, they're largely going to be looking at the cartilaginous buttons that are just below the ribeye once they rip the carcass, what we call the buttons. The more of that cartilage that has turned to bone, very much like we do when we age, that means that the, the carcass is older. So we evaluate. Uh, here's an immature carcass looking at those very shiny cartilaginous buttons. But you'll notice they get more dull or more os ossified, uh, basically more coarse or red, as that, that cartilage turns to bone. And that's, that's largely how we're going to evaluate the age of the carcass. Secondarily, we'll also look at the color of the lean. Uh, but very often, this is, this is how we're going to be, be aging carcasses. Uh, color, uh, as you can imagine, as the animal ages, the lean gets darker. And so this is a secondary way that we can also evaluate the age of the carcass. There are a number of locations also throughout the carcass that we can also look at cartilage. Uh, but again, those thoracic buttons are going to be a big one. Marbling, our other factor, uh, basically you're talking about how much of that marbling is there, and then also the texture of the marbling. A finer texture is certainly good. Uh, these, th these amounts actually go from abundant, this is a technical phrase, abundant, all the way down to practically devoid. Okay, and so the amount of marbling there is going to be a higher quality. Um, looking for a fine texture as opposed to a coarse texture and a very evenly dispersed marbling. And so if you were to look here as, as, as far as marbling is concerned, here's your, here's, here's your slight amount of marbling. Basically, this is the bottom of select. Okay, as you move up, this is your small amount of marbling. This is low choice and A and B, A maturity. Uh, moving even higher, you've got modest, which would be average choice, and moderate, which is high choice. As you can see, the amount of the, of the fat within this muscle continues to increase, indicating a higher eating quality. Slightly abundant, which is basically the bottom of prime, if it's an A maturity, and then moderately abundant, which would be average prime. Very infrequently do you see anything above, uh, above this card here, but these are the actual standard cards. Um, again, we're not holding these cards up to every carcass. Uh, it's, it's done very subjectively by the grader, and, and over a number of carcasses you can be trained to do this. Uh, texture, again, you're looking for a finer texture as opposed to a coarse texture. Nobody wants a coarse texture to stay. If you've ever had that before, it's, for, it's perceived as being sinewy or chewy. And so again, you may actually have to pull something out of grade based on its texture. Texture, there are actually standards for this. If you were to look at USDA standards for texture, from fine all the way out to coarse. Uh, if you'd like to make that comparison, if you've ever seen the surface of a raw filet mignon, that's a very fine texture. If you've ever seen the surface of a brisket, that's a very coarse texture. Okay, so that's the differences in sort of the amount of connective tissue that you would be able to find in those, those muscles. Talking a little bit about yield grade, and this one could get a little more confusing, and we can certainly spend a lot of time talking about yield grade. But simply put, this is telling me how much. How much of this can I eat in lean beef? Okay, and yield grades run from USDA 1 to USDA 5. Okay, 1 being the best, or the most cuttable, the most lean, which can be a little bit counterintuitive, the 5 being the worst or the, the, the most wasteful. Okay. This is done uh, with several different factors in mind and evaluated with several factors in mind. There's actually an equation that calculates this, basically a, a regression equation. I, again, I can tell you that this is not done in an evaluation by a grader, but this is how it was derived. There are certainly shortcut methods. You're considering fat thickness of the 12th rib, and I'll go into a little more detail. The actual hot carcass weight. Bigger carcasses should have bigger ribeyes, if you'd like to think of it that way. Uh, the percent kidney, pelvic, and heart fat, so that's where that KPH comes from, if you've ever seen it written. That's basically how much fat is on the inside of the carcass that I've got to cut out. Uh, and then also ribeye area itself. The bigger the ribeye, the more cuttable, the more lean. The smaller the ribeye, the more wasteful it will be uh, per animal unit. What do these equate to? Very best case scenario. If I've got a yield grade one carcass, this is telling me that in what we call boneless, closely trimmed retail cuts, uh, the steaks and roasts that I'm after, we're talking about 52 to almost 55 percent of that carcass, that cold carcass, is going to be boneless, closely trimmed retail cuts from the, the four main lean cuts. 
We can get some secondary wholesale cuts that'll push our, our yield up a little higher, maybe 60 to 65 percent. But for the most part, you have to remember that, again, going back to the concept of dressing percentage where you lose uh, 38 percent, and then again you lose another 45 percent, this is where, again, the price continues to rise. And you can back calculate this in a break given uh, scenario. But again, yield grade one being the best, the highest yielding, yield grade five being the worst, the lowest yielding. Doesn't seem like much of a difference between 45% and 43%, but obviously over thousands and thousands of pounds, uh, this is the margin, this is the difference. Um, why do we care about hot carcass weight? Basically these range, uh, live weights typically range from about 950 all the way up to about 1500 pounds. And as you can, you can see an historical trend from 1970 to today, that is almost linear as far as the size of the animals that we're putting through the plants. Uh, but we're talking about carcass weights that range from about 500 to 1000 pounds. So if you go back to those weights that we saw in that Carlisle report, you can see where you can get discounts for small carcasses or large carcasses. Why are those discounts there? If I'm cutting pieces to go in boxes, then you want to make sure that you get four pieces per box, five pieces per box. It's got to fit your equipment, and it's got to fit what the consumer wants. Fat thickness, basically this is an indication of fat that's under the hide, on the back. This is evaluated if we cut between the 12th and 13th rib on a cold carcass. If we move our weight three quarters of the way down the ribeye, we evaluate the amount of fat uh, basically opposite the ribeye there. And those are going to correspond to uh, what we call preliminary yield grade in a shortcut method. Uh, this is done visually by a grader, and this is probably the, the highest influence fa influencing factor that, that contributes to yield grade, uh, because this is our starting point, if you will. Um, what's the difference? I can tell you if you look at a carcass here, this carcass is a yield grade one. You can see it's got less back fat. A yield grade two carcass is going to have slightly more, moving more to yield grade three, and then obviously yield grade four. Um, that's, that's, that's what you're talking about. It doesn't seem like a lot of fat uh, difference, but it really is once you've got the height off. This is, stuff, these, this is fat that I can't cut off with my knife, and we will. Uh, we don't tolerate even an eighth of an inch of fat anymore on the outside of our steaks and roasts. Uh, we're basically down to zero trim. So all that's got to get cut off and not sold. And it's not going to go into pink slime. We can talk about pets <laughs> some other time. I've only heard pink slime come up five times before we started. So uh, again, we'll touch on that maybe a little later. This is your kidney, pelvic, and heart fat. Again, this is stuff that I can't sell as meat. Okay, it's living in this channel here, around the kidneys, in the pelvic area, and then further down around the heart. Okay, again, this is contributing to the weight of the carcass. It's not contributing to the, to the marketability of the carcass. And so if you can imagine, the higher, the more there is, but the higher percentage of the carcass weight there is of this, the more wasteful it is. And so this is going to impact yield grade in a negative way. It's going to drive the numerical yield grade up, uh, which is, is certainly a bad thing. Ribeye area, again, I talked about ribeye area. So we've got our surface here between the 12th and 13th rib. Uh, not only am I going to look at fat thickness opposite that, but I'm going to actually consider the size of this ribeye, this loin muscle. Okay, again, if we were to take the time, we would actually use a grid. And this is in tenths of square inches. Um, in reality, again, we're looking at this and making a subjective evaluation five seconds, maybe seven seconds at the most, to evaluate the size of that ribeye in comparison to the weight of the carcass. And so again, the mentality is the larger the carcass and the heavier the carcass, the larger the ribeye should be. And in our shortcut method, we actually dictate this. We always say a 700 pound carcass should have a 12.2 square inch ribeye. If it doesn't, its yield grade will suffer. Its, its numerical yield grade will rise. And so again, we've talked about all of these factors, we plug those into our equation, and that's what we get here if we were to go in it the long way. Again, it's done very subjectively the short way, and that's, again, where we end up with our yield grade. When we compare that into quality, uh, again, this is where we're going to get our price on the grid. Um, so just some other carcass terms that you may have seen in the past, largely discount terms, some of them premium terms. Uh, dark cutters, like I showed you with BQA and, and animal handling, dark cutters will receive a discount on the grid um, per carcass. Uh, no rolls, basically, or low choice, we'll get a discount on the grid, and I'll certainly let uh, our next speaker discuss that a, a, good, a good bit more. Uh, bullet carcasses uh, or stags are going to receive a discount. Dairy-type carcasses in a beef uh, plant, meaning uh, showing indications of being a dairy-type carcass, meaning it's got a, an irregularly shaped ribeye, will also receive a discount. And then there are going to be premiums for things that will qualify for your certified programs, like certified Angus beef, etc.